We will turn each and every stone. These are the words President Christine Lagarde used during her first ECB press conference in December 2019. She was announcing the launch of our Monetary Policy Strategy Review. It was the first one to take place since 2003. We spent the next 18 months working together with colleagues from central banks across the euro area. Their task? To figure out whether our strategy was still fit for purpose. How does online shopping affect prices? Is the way we analyse the economy still up to date? And are we communicating with people in the right way? These were just some of the questions that guided the review. And earlier this summer, we announced our new monetary policy strategy. You're listening to the ECB podcast, bringing you insights into the world of economics and central banking. My name is Katie Ranger. I'm here today with our chief economist, Philip Lane, to discuss what the review was all about. Philip, welcome to the ECB podcast. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, this was the first time we reviewed our strategy in just under two decades. Very simple question to kick off. Why now? Well, I think uh, maybe two reasons. One is clearly overdue. uh, And I think every organisation should have a regular review. And by the way, one of the decisions we made was we were going to take a look at our strategy in 2025. So we've already said uh, uh, we're committing to the next review. During these years, uh, between 2003 and uh, 2021, of course, a lot happened. We had the global financial crisis, Mm -hmm. we had the euro area crisis, and of course, most recently, we've had a pandemic. So I think, uh, why now? Partly uh, a lot of those crises and also slower moving structural changes in the world economy uh, has raised questions for basically all central banks. And so it's very good timing uh, to take a good look a comprehensive look, and as you indicated, uh, using uh, all the resources of the euro system across all of the national central banks, as well as the ECB. And I I do think uh, even though it took 18 months and took a lot of work, uh, it was very important uh, to to do this review. Now, keeping prices stable is really at the core of what we do here at the ECB. And as part of the review, we adopted a new price stability objective of 2%. Can you explain why we went for 2%? So I think uh, it's a balance between two considerations. One, if you like, is the traditional consideration which all central banks in history have had, which is uh, we know excessively high inflation is very costly. It's costly for economic performance. It's socially disruptive. Uh, It it really is a problem, for example, which is uh, extremely... uh, unequal in its impact and where we know the poorest parts of society suffer the most. Mm -hmm. So it's always been the case that central banks dislike excessively high inflation. What is maybe uh, new, I mean, there are elements of this already 20 years ago, but reinforced now is we also understand that it's a mistake to allow inflation uh, to go too low. Uh, Very definitely uh, problems if you have deflation, so prices falling. But in fact, uh, you need a a significant buffer above zero uh, because uh, you need a a reasonable amount of inflation uh, in order to allow the economy to work smoothly. To deal in particular with recessionary shocks, it provides a more stable environment. So I suppose uh, we ended up at 2% with that balancing act. And of course, it should be said, uh, 2% is an extremely popular uh, target around the world (laughs) because we're not the only central bank dealing with these uh, considerations. And so I think having this 2% target uh, at this point in time makes a lot of sense. Now, there are two things that I've read in relation to this 2%. Um, Number one, that it's symmetrical. That's the idea that we want inflation to neither be too high nor too low, right? Right. So so on on that consideration, it's as I just indicated, uh, for sure, we don't like excessively high inflation and we don't like excessively low inflation. And if you like uh, this idea of symmetry, uh, it's it's one way to capture that sensation that that we equally uh, find it undesirable to have excessively high or excessively low. And of course, for, for kind of the technical economist in the audience, very many economic models have this feature of essentially a symmetrical uh, 
target for for a central bank. Okay. Another thing that I've read about the objective is that it's clear and easy to understand. And this is a an aspect that I quite like to unpack a little, this kind of communication aspect of it. Why is that so important? One important way in which uh, central banks ca- can deliver price stability is, if you like, trying to coordinate society. Mm-hmm. And coordinating society where firms, when they are trying to work out where is inflation going to be, individuals, so often, of course, I don't need to be overly concerned with inflation on a day-to-day basis. But let's sure. say um, <laughs> I'm uh, working out uh, whether I should borrow to buy a house, to buy a car. I, I need to have a reasonable sense of the inflation rate I can expect in over the coming years. So uh, governments need to take a view. Basically, all sectors of society need, need to take a view about where to think inflation is going to be on average. And so uh, having a clear easy to remember, easy to communicate, uh, 2% target helps with that. I should also say it helps with with accountability. We are holding ourselves up here because we're saying we're aiming to to deliver 2% over the medium term. And it's reasonable to ask us questions if we do not deliver that clear target. Whereas if we had a very fuzzy definition of, uh, of what it means to have price stability, uh, it'd be very hard for anyone to to kind of uh, hold us to account in the sense of saying, you know, you're not doing your job. Whereas here, w- we have invited in- accountability by saying, here's our aim. And uh, if we have deviations from that aim, uh, it would be on us to explain why inflation has deviated from the target. But of course, anchored in delivering 2% in a stable way over the medium term. Okay, so it's basically a lot about helping people to plan and a little bit about this accountability as well. Right. So I think uh, both dimensions are important. Okay, so we've spoken a lot about what we want inflation to be, 2%. Now, to know how far or close you are to achieving that goal, you obviously need to be able to measure prices and how they change over over time. I can't imagine that's very easy in the euro area because, well, we have 19 countries using the euro and they're all very different in the the kind of things that they spend their money on. And Philip, this idea of measuring inflation was indeed one of the topics in the review. And I'm keen to know a bit more about why you included it and and the kind of things that you looked at. So so you raise uh, some uh, fundamental issues here. So let me... uh, start off by saying, of course, uh, the measurement of inflation is actually conducted by Eurostat, the European uh, Statistical Agency. So let me broaden uh, your your question to to really be not just about measurement, but interpretation. Um, And uh, also in terms of scope, and maybe the scope issue is important, is uh, one uh, feature that has been many times raised with the ECB was essentially um, we didn't pass the common sense test for many people in the sense of when they say, well, how do I spend my income? Housing costs Uh, featured a lot more in uh, many people's uh, internal accounting than appeared to be the case in our uh, price index. Uh, and in particular, although re- those uh, who rent, the, the rental costs have been in the price index and are important, a lot of people in the euro area own their home. And so the costs uh, associated with owning a home, whether buying the home, uh, maintaining it, the occasional renovation, uh, insuring that home, that, that was uh, undercounted in, in the price index. Mm. So we do think, and by the way, this came out loud and clear when we did the various ECB listens events. And I should say your system listens really, because a lot of national central banks ha- had these types of event. Uh, this was, a, I think, really just common sense. We need uh, to find ways to expand the measurement of the price index to uh, do a better job of including those costs. This is a going to be a long term project because it it requires all sorts of regulatory changes, uh, new approaches, um, with, of course, the lead role with Eurostat. But of course, uh, if you have a long term goal, you should start now in order to make sure you ultimately achieve that. And I should say in the meantime, uh, we also make clear in the review, uh, 
we, we already have uh, various partial in, uh, pieces of information and we will take these into account when uh, studying inflation. Let's dive a bit deeper into some of the other areas that we looked at. Now, the review itself was made up of 14 key topics, and they ranged from very specific things like our monetary policy toolbox, or how we analyse the economy, to much broader developments like globalisation and even digitalisation. Now, for those listeners who are keen to go into a little bit more depth, we've actually just published several papers with background material on our review, You'll be able to find all the links to that in the show notes. So the thing I'd like to look at next is employment. In other words, how many people have jobs? What kind of jobs do they have? And how much are they paid for those jobs? Philip, could you explain a bit why the employment situation is important for our monetary policy? How do our decisions impact jobs and vice versa? Sure. So I think... uh this was a very important work stream in the overall review for, for several reasons. One is we know in the end a large fraction of what goes into prices, in fact, are wages. So about two thirds of the economy can be thought of as the contribution from workers. Two thirds? Two thirds. Um, and of course, that varies a little bit across countries, but more or less, that's a broad uh, proxy. So when you know that two thirds of prices basically reflect wage developments, you have to understand what's driving uh, wage dynamics in the economy. And of course, a pretty basic uh, overall factor there is how hot is the labor market? Clearly, uh, wage is going to grow more quickly if there's a high level of labor demand. Um, so, so that is a kind of classic issue. But let me emphasize also, again, going back to the point I just made about data, in a world where we know more and more uh, about kind of individuals, know more and more about different sectors, we can also understand that that overall dynamic can also be better understood by understanding the dynamic of, for example, um, differences in participation rates uh, across age groups, uh, between men and women, mm -hmm. um, as you said earlier on, across countries, because, of course, labor markets differ quite a bit in the euro area. Sure. So having that granularity, uh, having that kind of uh, concentration on understanding the full range of what goes into the European labor market is very important. So, so th that is essentially a, a pretty basic uh, building block for understanding the inflation. Let me mention, I suppose, a second dimension, which has always been there. It was there from where go at the ECB, and it's there all the time for every central bank, which is right now, um, essentially in a world where we have inflation below our targets uh, and we have uh, accommodative monetary policies. By and large, uh, these policies are uh, pro-employment. Uh, low interest rates stimulate uh, firms uh, to expand, to hire more workers, uh, most basically. Uh, but there are scenarios uh, where essentially there could be a tension between what is uh, what we need to do to control inflation and what is good for employment. For example, in the 1970s, we had these large oil shocks, which uh, drove up inflation, but were also uh, pretty bad for employment. So one important element in the review was we spent quite a bit of time uh, re reviewing and returning to the topic of the medium term. Because what, what we essentially say is we aim to stabilize inflation at 2% over the medium term. And that medium term perspective gives us the room, uh, if it's needed, uh, to tolerate some short term uh, deviation of inflation from the target, mm -hmm. if that is what is needed to allow the labor market to handle one of these shocks. So it's always been a part of, a, I think, every central bank's philosophy, which is you don't need to hit 2% every week or every month. If there is a conflict between um, what, what is needed to deliver uh, uh, price stability and what is needed to support the labor market, uh, having a, a flexible interpretation of the medium term allows us 
to you know make a contribution to managing that trade off. I should say you know it's always going to be over a limited time period. It's not something right now that that is kind of to the forefront uh, because we have been in this uh, phase right now for quite a while of uh, monetary policy with low interest rates and our other instruments. Uh, we do think is quite supportive of employment. Mm -hmm. And for example, in this pandemic period, uh, we do calculate that the level of employment recovery in Europe would have been a lot less without the, the policies we have adopted. So we do very much take into account uh, the, con the impact of our policies on employment. Number one, because it matters for, for the inflation dynamic. And number two, where there are kind of uh, trade-offs we recognize that we can manage those trade-offs to a, a flexible view of the medium-term concept. Well, it's really incredible to hear just how many things you've had to have on, have on your radar during this, this review. And the last topic I'd like to discuss is actually another one, climate change. Now, two years ago, nobody would have thought that climate change would have been on a central bank's agenda. And here we are now with a whole action plan for taking climate change into account in our work. This was actually one of the big outcomes of the strategy review. Philip, as the chief economist of the ECB, you're most concerned about meeting our inflation goal. What's climate change got to do with, with that? Let me emphasise is that the topic of climate change has been around, honestly, for decades. I uh, did my PhD in the early 90s. And even in the early 90s, I mean, many of my colleagues were working on this topic. Mm -hmm. So what is maybe uh, new now is we all know, also recognize that climate change is quite nonlinear. I think the evidence is accumulating that climate change is it matters right now. It's no longer just a topic for the future. And of course, uh, with the Paris Accord and with the implementation of, of those commitments here in Europe, we know a lot is going to happen in terms of transition policies over the next decade. So it's very much a here and now issue now, with, whereas maybe a number of years ago, you could say, well, we, we will have to deal with it in the future. But the, the, the day has come. Yeah. And let me emphasize maybe two parts of that from a, a monetary policy point of view. One it is already uh, over the two years since I've been here at the ECB understanding the implications of extreme weather events. For example, the very hot summer we had in Europe in 2019. Yeah. Uh, this winter uh, ver around the world has been quite a lot of disruption uh, to production of semiconductors, uh, to, to the coffee uh, ha prospects for coffee harvests from extreme weather. So we already, in terms of the usual cyclical variation, uh, weather shocks are becoming more important. But maybe a bigger issue, and because of course the central banks we are forward looking, it is the implication of all of the policies we know will need to be adopted to allow a transition to a, a low carbon or zero carbon economy. And this is a major structural change, uh, which will involve a major uh, reform, if you like, especially of the energy pr producing sector a major reform of how we uh, use energy across the economy. So it's you know, economy-wide pervasive structural change. And uh, we, we need to model this, we need to understand it because it really is a first order macroeconomic issue. So, you know, uh, it's not uh, complicated in terms of uh, the, the, the basic conclusion that central banks need to invest in understanding the carbon transition, understanding uh, the increased frequency of extreme weather events, because clearly these have macroeconomic implications and therefore implications for price stability. OK, before we wrap up, I ask all our guests here on the podcast for a hot tip on today's topic. Philip, what tip would you like to share with our listeners? Well, let me offer two tips. One is uh, anyone who's listening to this podcast should really uh, make plans to also in the next few days uh, keep track of the ECB Central Banking Forum, Absolutely. Uh, which uh, we always refer to as the Sintra Forum, even though, of course, it's online this year. So we're going to be looking at the challenges facing monetary policy beyond the pandemic. Uh, 
It's going to be some very good academic sessions, some important uh, policy panels, and maybe the highlight uh, will, will be the, the uh, interaction between President Lagarde, uh, Ch Chairman Powell of the uh, Federal Reserve, and then uh, Andrew Bailey, the, the governor of the Bank of England, uh, in, in the policy panel. So this, for, for central bank, uh, uh, those interested in central banking is real highlight for the year. But maybe also uh, we've talked a lot today about the major challenges facing the world economy, uh, the challenges facing policymakers. So I would just offer also a personal recommendation. Uh, last week, I also had the chance to read uh, the memoir written by Amartya Sen mm. called At Home in the World. And Amartya Sen is just a remarkable economist and Indeed. of course, a philosopher and a uh, Anyone interested remotely in economics, I, I think, will find a lot of value in reading uh, his, his memoir of his early years. Two great tips. Thank you so much, Philip. It's it's been a real pleasure speaking today. In, indeed, thank you for for your questions and your interest. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode. I should mention that we have a lot of information about the strategy review in simple everyday language on our website. We've even got cartoons. So if you're interested in learning more, do check out the show notes for the links. You've been listening to the ECB podcast with Katie Ranger. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe and leave us a review. We'd also love to hear from you. So do share your feedback and ideas with us via social media. Until next time, thanks for listening. <laughs>